By September 2017, the siege of Marawi in the Filipino province of Mindanao had claimed hundreds of lives and displaced thousands of people in the region. As the armed forces of the Philippines geared up for their final assault on the strongholds of the Malte Group, an Islamic State affiliated cell in the city that threatened to claim Marawi and the surrounding area for ISIL, events began to take an unprecedented turn. Standing alongside the government's soldiers were several hundred fighters from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, determined to cast aside long-held divisions in order to drive extremism out of this part of the Philippines. A month later, the battle was over, victory was declared, and the ISIL threat in the Philippines was extinguished. We're getting ahead of ourselves here, but it's important to establish a few facts before we begin. The story of the Philippines' Muslim community and its history of resistance is a complex one. We're not talking about a battle between governmental power and religious fundamentalism. Instead, we're looking at a long and complicated chain of events that began many centuries ago and is based upon ideas of identity, belonging, and freedom. To understand this story, we need to go back to the beginning. Long before the Philippines as a concept even existed, the archipelago was ruled over by a number of different states, each occupying a portion of the territory that is now united as the sovereign country we all know today. From Samtoy, Kabalawan, and Namayan in the north, down through Ma'i and Ibalon to Maguindanao and Sulu in the south, these states operated according to a sophisticated class system and would likely have traded with merchants from China across the sea to the northwest. Between the 14th and the 16th centuries, however, things began to change, and the development of what is now known as the Philippines would take on an international aspect. First, the arrival of the Arab missionary Maktoun Karim and the establishment of Islam in 1380, followed by the subsequent spread of the religion across the islands and archipelagos of the south. Second, the landing of Ferdinand Magellan almost half a century later. Magellan, famous for planning but crucially not completing the first successful circumnavigation of the globe, made landfall at Cebu in 1521 and formed good relations with the state's king Raha Humabon. Enlisted by Humabon to fight his enemies in the island of Mactan, led by the now legendary Lapu Lapu, Magellan's crew suffered a disastrous defeat and Magellan himself was killed. Lapu Lapu and Mactan remained powerful symbols of indigenous resistance in the area. While not fighting under the banner of Islam, Lapu Lapu's defeat of Magellan is an important part of our story. Lapu Lapu's victory over Magellan may have been symbolic, but it was not decisive. By 1565, Spanish colonization of the archipelago began in earnest along with the conversion of much of the indigenous population to Christianity, and Manila became the capital of the Spanish East Indies soon after that. However, it was the peoples inhabiting the south of the archipelago, a collection of Islamic tribes and sultanates known to the Spanish as Moros, or Moors, that were the serious thorn in the side of the invaders. By 1575, the Spanish had defeated the Malay Sultanate of Brunei, but the Islamic peoples of the southern Philippines continued to resist, with some success. Bolstered by support in the forms of arms and supplies from the Chinese, the Moros people fought on, while Chinese raiders under the command of Koshinga carried out a campaign of harassment against European coastal colonies. For an astonishing three centuries, three decades, and three years, the Islamic peoples of the southern Philippines fought on, refusing to allow their colonial oppressors full control over the country. Even after the Spanish conquest of the regions of Mindanao and Sulu, the Moro rebels continued their resistance, suffering heavy casualties and refusing to let the Spanish rest. This defiant middle finger to the forces of colonialism, oppression and conquest would set the tone for what was to come. In these parts of the Philippines, the bravery, determination and independent spirit of generation upon generation of fighters are not forgotten to this day. The Spanish Moro conflict ended in April 1898, bringing the curtain down on 333 years of bloody fighting. Only this is not quite true. The fighting remained, just the enemy was different. 
The Spanish-American War was brief compared to the conflict between the Spaniards and the Moros, but it would have long-lasting implications. Following the Treaty of Paris in August of the same year, the Spanish Empire ceded territory across the Caribbean and the Pacific Ocean to the Americans, including the Philippines. Except, not everyone agreed that the Philippines was theirs to cede. Not least the Tagalog revolutionaries who sought total independence for the islands. The Americans won the Battle of Manila in 1899 but understood the bitter fighting that would be required to control the Philippines as a whole. They understood, and likely feared, the committed resistance of the Islamic peoples in the south of the region and used diplomatic channels to keep the Moros out of the war. After subduing forces in the north, however, the United States would turn their full attention toward bringing the southern islands under their colonial yoke. What followed was the Moro Rebellion, a 14-year campaign of resistance against American forces that lasted until the eve of the First World War. Once again, a colonial power was locked in conflict with Filipino Muslims in the south of the country. The Americans found that resistance in the south was difficult to break down, and the Moro tactic of deploying Juramentado warriors, essentially suicide attacks, put the occupying forces under immense strain. While the US forces eventually achieved victory at the Second Battle of Budaho in 1911, officially annexing the last remaining pockets of independence in the Philippines, meaningful military occupation was almost impossible. The communities that had resisted colonial occupation since the 1500s remained fiercely independent into the 20th century. Keep the flag flying, General Douglas MacArthur said to Major General George Moore as he left Manila in 1942. I'm coming back. By May of that year, the Philippines had fallen and a third occupier had entered the fray, the Empire of Japan. Whether the Japanese invaders were fully aware of the four centuries of resistance put up by the Moros in the south of the country, or whether they even cared, is unknown. What is certain, however, is that the Moro peoples, the Taosugs in Sulu, the Maguindanaos in Mindanao, and the Maranao Moros in the Lake Lanao region, were prepared to fight with the same ferocity they showed against the Spanish and the Americans. Juramentado suicide attacks became common against Japanese troops, and Moro fighters used a range of traditional bladed weapons to dispatch foreign soldiers in a grisly fashion. The apparent fearlessness of the Moro guerrillas, combined with the horrific nature of their attacks, struck fear into the hearts of the Japanese. Accounts describe a fearful atmosphere among the occupying forces, some of whom chose to be shot rather than succumb to torture and mutilation from the resistors. Other witnesses described Moro troops fighting basically everyone they came across, from the Japanese occupiers to the Americans left behind and even Filipino non-Moros from the north of the country. In some cases, however, the Moros seemed to focus their efforts on expelling the Japanese, even trading the sliced off ears of Japanese prisoners for awards of cash and ammunition from American guerrilla forces. The Japanese in classic World War II fashion fought terror with terror, putting entire families to death as punishment for a Huramantado suicide attack and dissecting still living Moro prisoners under the guise of scientific study. Such measures were unsuccessful, however, and some commanders tried a different tack. Major Hiramatsu made contact with Datu Busran Kalao of the Marano Moro peoples, calling him Brother Oriental and encouraging him to join their cause. The plea was ignored, however, and a subsequent massacre of a detachment of Hiramatsu's troops reportedly left no survivors. By late 1944, MacArthur was making good on his promise to return. The Philippines campaign, coupled with heavy losses to the Japanese war machine, was reversing imperial gains across the Pacific. It would take a further 10 months to eliminate Japanese strongholds in Mindanao and elsewhere in the south, but the writing was very much already on the wall. The Japanese would lose control over the Philippines, lose the war, and never subdue the Moro peoples of the southern islands. The three years that the Moros spent fighting the Japanese and everyone else in the Second World War might seem like just a drop in the ocean compared to the four centuries they'd spent resisting colonial occupation. But this period of Filipino history remains a crucial one. 
Those southern islands and the people who live there are prepared to resist, resist, and resist some more. What was true in 1521 was still true in 1944 and remains true to this day. For more than three centuries, the Moro peoples of the southern Philippines repelled, resisted, and refused to be beaten by their Spanish colonial adversaries. Next, it was the turn of the Americans to witness the fury of an occupied, subjugated people firsthand. Half a century on, and the Japanese found themselves fighting this relentless enemy that simply would not give ground and made up for a lack of ballistic weapons thanks to skill with sword and steel. Fast forward another half century into the digital age, the age of global community, information and knowledge, and it's the fighters of the Islamic State who are suffering the wrath of the Moros. Half a millennium of resistance, 500 years on from the arrival of Magellan, the peoples of the southern Philippines remained unbowed. This was never about a battle between Islam and Christianity. The conflict with ISIL showed us this. Nor was it a clash between East and West. The Moro warriors were just as resilient against the forces of the Emperor of Japan as against those of the President of America or the King of Spain. Instead, this has always been about homeland, culture, ways of life, and a dogged determination to defend all three. What do you reckon about the story of the Moro's resistance? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always guys, thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something new.